I'm not going to be speaking to the whole church this morning. I'm going to be speaking to a select few, and yet the message is for all in a way that uh, we're learning something about God's heart toward people who fall, people who backslide, people who are down, people who have been shipwrecked or ruined. My message this morning, God doesn't give up on his children who fall. God doesn't give up on his children who fall. Now, I presume that many of you here have never fallen, and I presume that you will never fall, that you'll be faithful to the Lord, you'll love the Lord, but you know people who have fallen. And this is a message that you need to bring to them. I trust that you absorb it and take it into your spiritual being. And this will be ammunition that you can use, and I hope it will mold your own thinking and how you approach those people who have fallen, backslidden, those that might have known the Lord and now they could be out on the streets or whatever. We pray this morning that God will use this word. God doesn't give up on his children who fall. Let's pray. I'm so glad, Lord, that you don't give up on your children who fail you who turn to the world or go back into sin. You do not give up on them. And Lord, there are people sitting in this church right now who have fallen. You made it clear to me that you can design a message, prepare a message even for one person, somebody that could travel across the world or across the country and place them in this church this morning and cause the whole congregation to sit and listen while you deal with one individual. I've seen that happen over and over again. Lord, I don't know who you're, you're speaking to this morning, but in a way you're speaking to all of us in our attitude toward those who have fallen. Lord, let us know something of your heart this morning. Touch me, anoint me. Lord, sanctify me, purge me by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, and give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I grieve over the many children of God who have been falling away from Christ in these last days. It's a tremendous grief to my heart. It's a grief to any Christian and especially to any pastor. Christians who have fallen back into sin, and Christians who have fallen back into sin in every generation. Adam, the first man, fell into sin. And ever since Adam, God's children have been falling away from grace, away from God, away from Christ. Many who have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness return to the kingdom of darkness, back to their old sins, and almost daily, now somebody brings me a report of another child of God who has slipped and fallen, and some go back to drugs, some go back to alcohol, some go back to, to pornography, they go back to their old darkened streets, and there, there are some that, when they bring the report to me and I hear it, I say, oh no, not him or not her. I thought he was so strong, he seemed to be doing so well, wanting to do so right before God. How did it happen? And, or or the, I'll, I'll hear of some sister in the Lord who has fallen. I say, I can't believe that because there seems to be such energy of Christ and such a love for the Lord. How did it happen? Suddenly, they're gone. They have fallen. They, they've turned their backs on the Lord, so to speak, and they're back in their old habits. And I've, I've, I've had to shake my head in disbelief and say, I can't comprehend that. Now, it's true that this end-time generation that we're in right now faces greater temptation, greater stress than any past generation, because the Bible even says, evil men and seducers shall go worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible also predicts wickedness shall abound, and that means increase and multiply. And we're in, uh, in a time now where it's, it's reached uh, a point that's called critical mass that's spinning out of control, literally spinning out of control. And we see a time now when new kinds of sin and seductions and temptations are being introduced that you and I never even dreamed of or heard of just 20 years ago. The devil is getting very subtle, the seductions are getting stronger, the temptations stronger. You know, this... Uh, Yesterday, Saturday, I was down at Isaiah House, 
and uh, with Mark and a few workers uh, looking out the third store window over, uh, you can see 42nd Street and up 8th Avenue. <clears throat> and all I saw was grime, dirt. I saw pushers on the corner of 8th Avenue and 42nd Street uh, pushing their, their, their drugs to derelict human beings that could hardly walk. And uh, I, I saw later when I went out in the street, I, I had gone just a little bit and I saw two alcoholics and one was trying to help the other and he was just, blood was just flowing out of his mouth. He was vomiting blood all over the streets and the other guy didn't know whether to lean him over and another alcoholic came along and said, stand him up. And those those poor men, were, were they were all coughing, all diseased. All absolutely just a, a, a few uh, weeks probably away from death in the grave. And you, you see, on the third floor, you look up 8th Avenue and you see these cheap little porno uh, theaters where uh, AIDS-infected girls go through their boring routines. They're bored. They're, uh, many of them, very unattractive. And you see these poor uh, souls going into these porno houses, and it's heartbreaking. In fact, it's like an a image of, out of dirt, Dante's Inferno, uh, a, a literal vision of hell, and it just turns me off. It, it's a depressing thing. And yet, one, one young man who just took a fall this past week or two uh, said to, <clears throat> I think it was to Mark or to one of our workers, but you don't understand. You've never been on the streets. You see grime and you see dirt, and this turns you off. But that's temptation to us. That's temptation. I, I've never been able to understand that because I, I have served the Lord since I was a child. I've not lived on the streets, and I've not been, I, I have never been touched with those kinds of temptations. But, here in New York City, those temptations, they say, are getting stronger and stronger. I don't comprehend that kind of temptation. But whatever your temptation is, whatever the, however the devil can seduce you in your particular area of seduction, it is getting stronger, it's getting wider, and it's spreading and causing more and more of the children of God who have been saved and converted to fall back into their old ways. Last week, I was reading letters that pour into our office from all over the United States. We have, as, as you know, over 800,000 people on our mailing list, and we, we get 40,000, 50,000 letters uh, in a month. We, we sometimes get 10,000 in a week. And <clears throat> reading some of these letters is just heartbreaking, and something has happened in the past year especially the letters from wives who, who tell us that their husbands have just picked up and ran off, leaving them with, the, with their children, taking off with women half their age, and now he's backslidden. One preacher's wife said, my husband, a pastor, we've been married for over 25 years, now he's backslidden and he's living with an unsaved girl have his age. Pastors running off on their wives. Wives running away from their husbands. And the children caught in the middle. One wife wrote, she said, we've been married for over 20 years, three children, and my husband, I found out, has been cheating on me ever since we've been married. He's now left us and he's living with some girl, not married, but living with her. He said, she said, I can't explain the rage that came over me. But I took it to the Lord and God took all the rage out of my heart. I've forgiven him. And now I'm praying for him to come back. I'm not going to give up on him yet. I believe there's still hope. Now, most housewives, most of you married ladies that are sitting here right now, Say, no way, that's a skunk. There's no way I would ever take a creep like this back into my home. And I understand that. And the same if you're a man and your wife was promiscuous like this, uh, it would take some special kind of grace. 
You say, no way, he's cheated me all his life, he, he has done things against me and he doesn't want me, and I let him go. I'm so glad, though, that God doesn't think that way. Because, you see, many of us have turned to other loves. Many of us have cheated on God. And there are some of us sitting here right now, you, are, you have been cheating on the Lord. You have fallen into a sin. <clears throat> and I believe God gave me this message primarily for my own heart because I had been uh, rather discouraged lately. I've been going through a time of discouragement, not from the ministry, not Times Square Church. Uh, it, the discouragement is because I have seen so many the letters that are pointing into us of the backsliding, the turning away from the Lord, ministers that are falling, and people that are falling. Uh, I, I hear from my friends from California, from Texas, from all the United States, when they're on the telephone and when they visit here and they have even ten minutes with me, they say, you remember so-and-so. They'll name couple after couple that, uh, that I, I would have known twenty years ago, on fire for God, said, they don't even go to church now. They go to one of these super churches and they go Saturday night. So they say, we have all day Sunday to ourselves now. So they can go boating. They can, they can go and do their thing, especially in California. California, the big thing now is Saturday night church. So you go and have the whole day for football. You have the whole day to yourself. Go and, and soothe your conscience on Friday night. Get a little bit of a 15-minute sermon on how to cope and then go out and have ball games, do anything you want all day Saturday. And my friends tell me how grieved they are, those that are going on with God, all of their California, their Texas friends and others in some of these uh, states like Florida, saying, now we have all day Sunday to do our own thing. The zeal of God is gone, falling left and right, coldness uh, setting in in their hearts. Wanting to go to a church where there's no convicting message. Folks, I believe there's some churches that, that if, if, if Pastor Carter and I went there and preached some of the sermons and messages we preached here of Holy Ghost conviction, preaching against sin, they'd either run to the altar or have the congregation get up and run out, scared to death. Many of them not wanting to hear it because it would ruin their Sunday. It would ruin their camp. Uh, camping trip. They'd be under conviction all day. I'm not trying to be facetious, but you know, this, this, I have, I've heard lately of so many backslidings, so many falling, it, it discouraged me. And then it was not only that, but seeing even in Times Square Church, even in this church, many Christians who've been saved for a number of years, and You've had a past of abuse. Maybe your father abused you, your mother abused you. It could have been verbal abuse, could have been sexual abuse. There are others of you that have gone through terrible situations in your marriages. You, you have been wounded by some devil like this one I mentioned here who's cheating and, and, and mistreated. Maybe you were mistreated. Some of you have carried wounds and hurts for years. Some of you are part of a program here called Restoration in this church. It's a good program. God is blessing it, and many of you are being helped. But the thing that concerns me and the thing that, this, that, that brought some discouragement upon my heart, and I see some of you that have been coming here listening. I've been, we started here almost 10, ten years ago, and some of you have been here 10 years. Some have been hearing us preach. I've been preaching to some of you for five years. And Pastor Carter's joined me, and he's preached for at least two years to you. And we preached our hearts out to you. We, we go to God's Word. We don't bring you psychology. We don't bring you something from another man's head. We bring it from the throne room of God. We pray, and God moves upon us, and we stand here. I'm not preaching out of notes right now. I'm preaching to you out of my heart, and I'm telling you, the discouragement is that I see people go year after year praising the Lord, raising their hands, talking about victory, hearing messages on overcoming power of the Holy Ghost, and yet you still carry the burden around as though you were in the hand of the devil rather than the hands of God. 
rather almost as though there is no victory that you have to go all your lifetime leaning on somebody all of your lifetime weeping all of your lifetime carrying this burden and never laying it down never coming into a place of victory that concerns me that that is a pastor that that deeply concerns me that you are not you you can have friends around you you can have people you call you can have support groups i'm not against going to to counselors if you get good godly counseling now if you're getting half holy ghost and half freud you're going to be in a mess we got a lot of people using uh freud in the gospel and all they do is take freud and put a little gospel to it it is nothing but pop psychology and it's not going to heal you you're going to just have you're just going to have somebody you lean on for the rest of your life and i'm telling you it's time to start leaning on jesus and get a healing and that's what this message is about today that you can step out of that hurt step out of that because god hasn't given up on you and you're not in the hands of the devil that's what we're going to talk about this morning I, I, especially those who married couples that are here right now you, you're in a mess in your home you fight all the time you, you don't even believe you're in love with one another and all you do is coexist in the house it's like the cold war how, how many of you had it out this morning and you sit here now nobody knows because both of you smile and you may have even held hands when you walked in here but just wait till you get back in the car and I'm not trying to be cute, but I'm telling you now, there there are people who go on. There are some of you been coming to this church for ten years, or at least five years, and heard all this gospel. There's not been any change anywhere. You haven't been changed. Your marriage is not improving. You're 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 you are saying and speaking the same language you spoke five years ago. The, the same discouragement, the same, you, you just tell everybody about your problem. You're saying the same thing today you said five years ago. And that should not be. That should not be. That's not God's plan. I hear these stories from all of the United States. Letters from every state in the Union. Children of God who love Jesus. They want to do right. But when you listen to them talk... You, you, you hear them, the, the, the language of fear. There's no happiness in Christ. They live in misery. And then you, I'm tempted to ask the question, God, what's going on? Certainly, all Christians face temptations. All Christians face trials. All marriages are tried. All, all marriages go through difficulties. We face persecution and hard times, but why are so few of God's people coming into the promised rest that God has promised in His book? Where is that rest? Where is that peace? Where is the victory? Where is the growth? When do you move out of that? Or do you come to Jesus and say, He has all power, He has all majesty, he is all power over the devil and that live the rest of your life in misery and make it to be a lie rather than the truth. I agree we face more stress. We, we face more evil, intention, deception, immorality than any other generation. But God has promised us clearly that where sin abounds, His grace will much more, much more abound. That He's made provision for all of these things. It didn't catch God unawares that the, the times would be evil as they are. God knew it. He prophesied it. Now the devil has a clever strategy to keep fallen Christians down. It's the same device he uses to convince the bruised and wounded Christians that they can never be totally healed. And I know that there are some of you out, you, you doubt that you will ever be totally healed. You've been told or you've been convinced by somebody or by the devil that you're going to live the rest of your life 
carrying this wound or carrying a hurt that as long as you live, it'll always be there. And you might as well go to AA because that's where they tell you once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And I don't believe that for a moment. I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ has the power to deliver, absolutely deliver from the memory, from the habit. No. No. And here's the lie of the devil. You can't go back to God because he's angry with you now. You sinned against him. You can't go back. In fact, he's permitted me to take back the power over your life. You cannot go back. God really doesn't want you back. There's no way you can make it up to him. And this is the subtle lie of the devil that is holding millions of fallen Christians, millions of backslidden Christians, held, holding them in darkness and fear and anxiety, the sense that I can never make it back to God, I'll never make it up to Him, I'll never measure up, I have failed Him miserably, I don't even know if He wants me back. I've heard some of them say, well, Brother Dave, if you don't meet me on the streets, and there's a high pastor, and they're high as they can be. And then, then I discover they used to attend Times Square Church. And they'll hug me and, 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 and uh, they, they still love, they say, I still love the Lord. I still love Jesus. But they're absolutely bound by this lie. I, I have grieved him so much, I have heard him. And one young man said, Brother Dave, look, you can preach that, but you don't have the slightest idea how low I've sunk. You have the slightest idea what I've done. If you knew what I've done, you wouldn't even talk to me. You would never tell me. In his words, he was saying, you could never tell me that God can forgive what I have done. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that God does not give up on any of his fallen children. No matter how low you sunk, no matter what you have done, God, by his Spirit, does not give up on you. Hallelujah. I'm going to prove that to you in the course of the message this morning. I want to expose this lie here and now, and I want to prove to you that any fallen child of God has not given up by the Lord, and I want to prove to you that He has not given you over to the power of the devil. He's not given you into the hand of Satan. I'm going to ask that every one of you here this morning have been bruised and wounded and discouraged and depressed, and you've been carrying pain and wound for so long, and I'm going to ask you to trust God to let the Word this morning, no matter how weak your faith may be, that you are not in the teeth of the lion. The devil does not have his teeth on you. What you're going through right now is something you're going to have to come out of by a step of faith, and I want you to do it this morning. I want you to believe God within the next 15, 20 minutes, by the time I am finished, you're going to rise up out of that, as, out of that grave of despair because you're being held by a lie and nothing else. When that lie is exposed, you can rise up by faith. Now, in my reading of the Psalms, I read the Psalms every day, and this past week I came, I want you to go to Psalm 37. I came across, uh, a, a, some scriptures that encouraged me and took away all my discouragement. Because you see, you, you, you get, just, just leave uh, Psalm 37 open on your lap there a minute. You know, when you, when you see people falling, so, so many falling, and when you see so many Christians never coming into victory, this subtle lie, this subtle thought is, has the devil got some of these people in his hand? Has the devil got that much power that he's going to be able to come in and just rob the church of Jesus Christ at his will? And I'm reading this. I want you to read with me two verses in Psalm 37, verses 32 and 33. Verse 32, Psalm 37, The wicked watcheth the righteous 
and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Now, I looked this up. Now, the Hebrew, his, the wicked, where it says watcheth, it means, really what he's saying, the devil spies on the righteous. He spies on you. And I want you to know every step you take is being monitored by the principalities and powers of darkness. The devil can only be one place at one time, but he's got demon powers, he's got principalities, he's got powers. He has ways, the powers of hell have ways to monitor your steps. Now, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, but they're monitored by the devil and all the powers of Satan. Is the devil out to destroy you? Yes, he is. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Now, I want you to follow me closely, please. Listen, look this way and listen, if you will. It's beyond question, Satan comes to spy out the children of God for any little compromise, for any little turning aside, to, to leap upon it, to judge you, to condemn you before the Heavenly Father, to condemn your conscience. He will come with condemning power. The Lord says, though, the Lord will not leave you in his hand nor condemn you when you are judged. That means judged and condemned by the devil himself. He will not permit that. And I want you to follow me. Satan's determined to upset your walk with Jesus? Yes. Is he determined to try to get you to fall away from God's mercy and grace? Yes. Is he out to ruin your life and bring misery and pain and heartache and raise up enemies against you, turn your friends against you? Yes, that's all a part of his plan. But why does the devil seduce the children of God back to habits that they hate? And why does the devil use every device in hell to take them back into darkness, back to cold, wicked streets? D does he go after the children of God that were rescued out of his kingdom? Does he go back after them just so he can get them to serve him again? No. Does he go after them so that they can do honor to him and worship him? No, because the devil knows that God has made a covenant pledge that he will never let them go. He will go after them. He will not give up on them. And what the devil is saying, I have a certain limited time and a certain limited power, and I'm going to go after him because I've been spying on him and I see some weakness here. He's not been reading his Bible. He's not been praying. He's really not seeking God. And he's kind of flirting with those old sins. And there's, there is some ground that he's given to me. I'm going to move in. And the devil's not trying to get you, sir. He's not trying to get you, ma'am to come back and be a devil worshiper. He knows you will never worship the devil. He knows that once you worship Jesus, once that you always have that, that knowledge in you that the devil can't take away from you. And he knows that God will not turn you over into his hand. So he has a limited time and what he wants to do one thing, he wants to kill you, destroy you. That's why the Bible said that he's a lion going about roaring, seeking to devour. Not to keep as his own convert. Not to get worship to himself. He knows that cannot be. And he knows that if God has his way, the Holy Ghost is going to come and convict him again. And many are going to just go right back to the Lord because the good shepherd goes out to find the lost sheep puts him on his shoulder and brings him home. The prodigal gets tired of his sin, gets up and goes back to the father. And he knows that. He's out to kill you. He wants you to OD on drugs, you that have been on drugs. He wants you to get so drunk that you get uh, your, your mind satiated, that you, you, you can't think straight. He wants you to die on the street. He wants to kill you. He's out to destroy your physical body so that he can say, at least there is one who will never praise God again. And I have buried many. 
I have buried many. I've been, in the last 37 years, I've been to one casket after another where those who have fallen, <clears throat> and I have had the pain of conducting their funerals, and you can almost hear the devil laugh. You feel the awful darkness in the room, <clears throat> and all you can do is speak to those who remain. And it's almost as though you hear the devil laughing. Well, there's another who will never praise the Lord again. But you see, he cannot have them. And he knows, he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will not turn him over into his hands. Not into the teeth of the lion. You see... The devil really doesn't want you, believer, Christian. He really doesn't want you because he knows God's not going to let you go. He wants you dead. Now, David took a great fall, and he sinned grossly, grievously, he committed adultery, he committed murder, he lied, and he covered it up. Now, I've named you five sins right there. And there were many, many more. David uh, lied a number of times. David uh, faked lunacy before uh, the king. He, 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 he was a man that failed God miserably. Here's a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist who loved God more than life itself, he said. And he falls into deep sin. Now, folks, falling back into sin... When you fall, there are consequences, awful consequences. And David's life is an example. In fact, Psalm 38, the next one, is probably the most descriptive agony, describes the agony of a fallen child of God more than any passage in the Bible. Now, if you look at the, if you have a King James, it says the Psalm of David to bring to remembrance. David has already been delivered from, from his sin. He's been delivered from the situation that he's describing here, but he's going back and he's reminding of us, reminding us of the consequences of his sin. And everyone who falls, I'm telling you now, God will not give up on you. But I'm telling you, there are consequences. Because otherwise you would say, well, God's not going to give up on me. I'll go out and have a time. He'll come back and after I've had... Uh, and, and there are some drug addicts that go through our program, alcoholics. And that's the thinking, well, I, I, I miss the old life. I'll go back a while and I'll come back because I know Jesus loves me. I know God will bring me back. But they forget the awful consequences in the meantime. And listen to this man... Chapter 38, starting the first verse. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. Now he's talking about the consequences of his sin. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither any rest in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities are gone over my head. It's a heavy burden, they're too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease. There's no soundness in my flesh. And folks, I can tell you many, many drug addicts that were saved by the hundreds who went back for a week to stuck a needle in their vein and picked up AIDS. In one week came back to the Lord, and then a year or two later discovered that they had AIDS, and they know the only way they could have got it was that one week. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I've roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desires before thee, my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it is also gone from me. My lovers, my friends, they stand aloof from my sore. My kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me. They that seek my hurt speak mischievous 
things and imagine deceits all the day long, but I as a deaf man heard not. Verse 14, thus I was as a man that heareth not and whose mouth are no reproofs. Listen, folks, some of you, are you looking this way? How many of you this morning relate to what David's talking about? That even now, you you are going through something. I'm not talking about having fallen. I'm talking about you still carrying the hurt and the wound and the pain of something that happened in your childhood or in a marriage previous. And here you are serving the Lord now. That he's describing those who have not come out by faith. He's describing what he went through when, when he fell. He's talking about restless nights he can't sleep. He's talking about getting up all day long with this cloud hanging over his head. That he mourns, there's a sadness that he can't shake off. He's talking about the weakness that settled into his body, his mind, his soul, and his spirit. He's talking now about friends that have abandoned him. And, you know, sin will do that. It'll cost you your family, it'll cost you your children. Ask those that go through Timothy house. Ask those that go through Sarah house. Ask these who have lost so much. And there's, there are consequences to, 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 to falling. There's consequences to not taking a step of faith and coming out. Otherwise, you live your whole life in this condition David's describing. A heart the pants, strength that fails, the light of the eyes, no discernment, feeble, sore, broken, roaring all day long, disquieted, depressed. No soundness in my flesh. I'm not a sound thinking person. He's saying, I'm a troubled man. I'm bowed down greatly. When people come to church, week after week, bowed down. Morning, grieving from morning to night, every waking hour there's a grief that may have been caused by a past sin. Yes, your sins may have caused that, but you don't have to live in it. You don't have to continue in it. There is victory. There is deliverance in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, this is a song of, remem of, of remembrance. But you see, God didn't give up on David. Because you see, David didn't give up on God. Even though he knew he was in sin, though he was living in misery and paying for the consequences, he knew he was under the discipline of God. He was being disciplined, and God will discipline you because He loves you. And sometimes that discipline is your health, that discipline is the loss of all things. There is a discipline. But the point is, He does not give up on you. There is still hope. Because David in this same chapter says in verse 15, In thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou will hear me, O Lord my God. For I said, hear me, lest otherwise they rejoice over me when my foot slips. You'll find David saying at the end, Forsake me not, O Lord my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord my salvation. Now, I, I've got to move on quickly here. I want you to go with me. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in the New Testament, we, we are told that what happened to Israel in the Old Testament is for our instruction. How many of you know that's true? Everything you read about Israel is an illustrated sermon to us upon whom the ends of the world have come. There are at least three scriptures that prove that in the New Testament. So I want you to go to one of these Old Testament uh, Israel examples, Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Please let me hear the rustling of the leaves. I know you're following me. Uh, let's start reading at verse 7, please. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Folks, have you ever, have you ever looked at that verse? They provoked him at the sea, and then God comes along and says, even at the Red Sea? 
In other words, the greatest miracle in the history of mankind, he opens up a sea and they walk over, but even at the Red Sea, at the very sight of the greatest miracle they'd ever seen, they provoked him. Even at the Red Sea. Amazing. Next verse. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up, so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of them that hated them, because, you see, Pharaoh is a type of the devil. The armies of Pharaoh are a type of the principalities and powers of darkness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Now, this is what God wants for his children. He wants you to know you are not turned over to the hands of the devil. I have the power to destroy every demon entity that comes against you, every lie, every spirit of deception, every spirit of depression. I can deliver them. I can deliver you so that there is not one of your enemies left standing. Not one. He saved them from the hand to him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. We have been redeemed. The hand of the enemy means the power. The hand there means power. We've been redeemed from the power of the enemy. Hallelujah. I can't tell you how good it is to stand here and tell you no matter how I feel, no matter how many lies the devil would throw at me, no matter what kind of temptation, I am not under his power. Nor are you. You are not under his thumb. I get excited, forgive me for screaming, but you, you, how, how do you keep that quiet? You scream back at me all you want. Mm, hallelujah. Would you go to Psalm 31? I'm going to tie this down conclusively for our close. We're going to nail it. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to show you now a psalm of David. Now, don't try to race down and find out where it's at. Let me set it up. Look this way for just a minute. This is a promise being made to a, a man of God who failed who fell hard. And I, listen to what, because you're sitting here saying, well, Pastor Dave, this sounds all good, but it, that, that's for people who, who have not sinned like I have. You don't know what I've done. No, no, this is for those who are, are on their back, those who are downcast, depressed, are, and going through all the things you heard in Psalm 38. Start reading with me verse 7. Psalm 31. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversity. Stop right there. Don't read on. I would be glad, rejoice in thy mercy, because you've considered my trouble and has known my soul in adversity. And in the Hebrew, what it says, all through my trouble, all through my fall, all through whatever I've gone through, you have shown me compassion. You've known me and you've cared about me. And you didn't give up on me. Everything that I've gone through, even though I, even though I know I don't deserve your love or mercy, I don't deserve anything. Folks, I will tell you something. I don't deserve His anointing this morning. I don't deserve His blessing. I didn't do anything this week to deserve it. I didn't pray enough this week. I didn't believe enough this week. I didn't read my Bible enough this week as I usually do. It's been a busy week. And I said, God, when I preach, I'm sorry, but I don't deserve your anointing this morning because I didn't do anything for it. God says, good, because it's all by grace and mercy. None of you have earned anything from God. None of you could ever repay God for what you've done. You think, well, if God will forgive me if I come back to him and for a whole year I don't do anything wrong. 
No, 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 no. You could live a hundred years and not do anything wrong and still go to hell because you're not taking it by mercy and grace. But you see, he's saying, oh, God, you, you were good to me even though I was in adversity. You, you were there in my troubles. And then listen, and you have verse 8, and has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. He said, you gave me some rope. You gave me some space to be dealt with. You didn't try to kill me or destroy me or hurt me or condemn me. You gave me some space and you were there, compassionate and loved me. And all that time, the devil's outside. You still had the wall around me. And you didn't turn me over to the hands of the devil. Is that in your Bible? Then why aren't you saying, praise God? Praise God. Why don't you say to yourself, and you have not turned, put your name there. You have not shut David Wilkerson up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set David Wilkerson's feet in a large room. Mm-hmm. You know all that, all that God is saying? <clears throat> He's asking that there be godly sorrow that there be godly sorrow for sin. You you go and with this I close. You you start from, from Genesis, you go to Revelation, and all you know what you're going to hear? The heart of God all through it is return. Return to me. Return. And I'll forgive you. Return and be healed. Return. Let me read something. If you return unto the Lord house of Israel and put away your idols and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him, he will deliver you. First Samuel seven three. O Israel Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a cloud, a thick cloud, your sins. So return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 44, 21. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Return, backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. You backslid, return to me, and I'll heal that backsliding spirit. Return unto me, saith the Lord, Malachi 3, 7, and I will return unto you. Hallelujah. All God is asking is you quit blaming somebody for your problem. King David didn't blame Bathsheba for bathing nude where he could see her. He didn't blame Joab for being the instrument that really killed her husband Uriah. He could have said, well, all I did send him a note, Uriah is the one that sent, or Joab is the one that sent him up and killed him. He, he, he didn't blame battle fatigue. He said, I will be sorry for my sins. David's confession all along was, my sins are continually before my face. I will be sorry for my sin and I will return to the Lord. And the only thing that keeps you from returning to the Lord, backslider or fallen person, whoever you may be, is pride. Pride. If you would acknowledge your sin, quit blaming somebody. It's not your wife's problem. It wasn't your husband's problem. It's your own problem. And when you quit blaming people, quit blaming conditions, Saying, it's me, O oh Lord. You put your spirit in me. You empower me over this. I'm going to rise up by faith. Nobody to blame but myself. I will be sorry for my sin. I claim my victory because the devil has no power in my life anymore. Will you stand? Hallelujah. I want you to repeat after me now, loud and clear, all through this church. Are you ready? According to the Word, Satan has no power over a child of God. I'm a child of God, and I'm in the hands of my God, and not in the hands of Satan. 
No, raise your hands and thank Him for that. Just thank Him for that. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. We are not in the hands of the devil. We're in the hands of an almighty God. Now, God told me in His Spirit and prayer this week that I was to call for deliverance meeting. And we're going to do that right now. I want everybody in this building that's been bound by depression, you've been bound by uh, memories of, of, of the past, of your hurts and wounds and bruises and abuses. I want you to bring them and lay them down and not pick them up again. I'm asking everybody that had taken a fall, everybody on the brink of a fall, everyone who's backslidden who wants to come back to God, everyone with a cold heart who wants to get on fire. I want you to get out of your seat and come here, and I want God to bring deliverance to you. This is Deliverance Sunday morning. Up in the balcony, go to either side and come down Come down the stairs and down the aisles. We're going to take authority in Jesus' name over all the powers of hell and darkness. We're going to ask God to set you free today. That you will not, you will not continue another hour under that bondage. Jesus has come to deliver you, and this is your day of deliverance. If you're not right with God, if you're backslidden, if you took a fall, come back. He said, return to me, I'll return to you. Amen. Move in close, make room for those that are coming. Move in close, please. Take me not when my strength faileth. Thou which showed me great and sore troubles, you will quicken me again. You will bring me up again from the depths. You will increase my greatness. You will comfort me on every side. He the Lord shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also in, the, in him that hath no helper. It's the crying out to God. It's the saying, Lord, I am sorry for my sin. I turn to you in godly sorrow works repentance, the Bible says. Some of you have been reaping the consequences of falling uh, or, or backsliding or turning away from the Lord. But now the Lord wants to deliver you completely. He wants to restore the joy of the Lord to your heart. And by faith, we're going to take authority now over every demonic uh, lie of the devil. All of you that came forth standing in the aisles and here at the front, I told you this and I want you to hear it in your spirit now. Please hear it. The devil has been destroying you and holding you by a lie. It's a lie that he has power over you. It's a lie that he can control you. So that all these things that are happening to you, you, you can't just say, well, the devil's making me do it. No, that's the flesh. God has not turned you over to the power of Satan. You can have confidence right now that the Holy Ghost is with you. He is here to deliver you and help you. But you have to have that faith and that confidence right now as I pray that the Lord will cause these chains of these lies to drop away from you. Then say from now on, Jesus, I know that you're going to hold me. I am in the hand of the Lord. And put yourself in God's hand. He says, no man then can pluck you out of his hand. If you stay by faith, just just rest there by faith. No man can pluck you out of his hand. Hallelujah. I want everyone that came forward to raise your hands. Just lift up your hands. And I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I am not under the power of the devil. Because I renounce my sins. I have a love for Jesus in my heart, and I confess my sins. I return to the Lord and to His faith with all my heart. Oh, Jesus, I am in Your hands. I am under Your control and under the power of the Holy Ghost. The devil's a liar. I reject his lies. I am not under his power. I am not under his authority. I resist him by faith in the name of Jesus that he may flee from me in Jesus' name. Now just thank him right now. Lord, I thank you. Give him praise. I thank you, Lord. Now let me pray, let me pray for you, Father. I come with faith. I come as your servant. I come as a shepherd. 
And I come to you, Lord, directly to your very throne. You've invited me to come to the throne of mercy, receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. And this is a time of need. We have people that are standing here now that have come for deliverance. Lord, some have been bound by fear. Some of them bound by depression. Some of them bound by old memories of, of terrible things that have happened in the past. Lord, some are under the bondage and fear of, of your uh, disciplining hand. But, oh God, let them know that that hand is a hand of love. And you've come now, Lord, to deliver. Oh, Holy Ghost, mighty Holy Ghost of God, come now with delivering power and set people free. We speak against this depression, this bondage, this fear. Break the chains that bind. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, through the victory of the cross and the shed blood, we claim that we can be free from all bondages, all lies, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Now, lift your hands and say, in the name of Jesus, I claim my victory. I claim deliverance in the name of Jesus. Now, worship him now. Worship him. Lord, I worship you. This is the conclusion of the message. 